Good afternoon. My name is John Ortega, and today I will be talking about how we can use big data to assist with low resources and natural language processing. My goal is to show everyone at a high level how we are solving language problems using specific techniques from the most state-of-the-art machine learning paradigms. So, sit back, relax, and please enjoy the presentation. Today, I will be covering several topics concerning big data and low resource language processing. First, I'm going to give a little background so that everyone knows who I am and what it is that I do. Then, I will cover what no resources means and how it affects the field of artificial intelligence. Specifically, the subsection of artificial intelligence called natural language processing. Next, I will dive into how big data works in a language model. Big data will give way to the main parts of the language solution that includes embeddings and neural networks. I will cover the specific architecture that is currently used to solve the low resource problem. Finally, I will present the performance of the architecture presented to give an idea how well current NLP practitioners are doing at solving the problems. Here's some background of who I am and the stuff that I'm currently working on. I use artificial intelligence daily and attempt to solve natural language problems. And I derive analytics and other stats about how phenomena works. At Blackboard Insurance, an AIG company, I use NLP to solve problems related to the insurance industry. At New York University, I use NLP to solve translation problems, extract information from documents, and show others how to do the same. And finally, I'm up to defend my PhD thesis at the University of Alicante in Spain, which is based on machine translation technique called fuzzy match repair. I'm generally interested in things like machine translation, machine learning, startup businesses, and software development. I have a direct interest in things I'm presenting today and would gladly welcome any feedback you may have. Feel free to ask any questions or contact me directly after the presentation. Okay, let's jump right into the low resource problem and why it's important. Low resources refers to the amount of data or examples available to train a model that will understand well with hopes that models will perform as well as humans. One of the biggest problems where we see this in language that may be spoken but maybe not be necessarily written. For example, the picture here shows a language that may have only been written on walls and thus does not have any parallel resources such as direct translations of dictionaries or words. Without resources, it's nearly impossible to build a model that can understand writing on a wall or other text that a group of people may need help with. One can imagine how hard it must be if his or her native language is only understood by a few hundred people. How would he communicate with others? Google Translate? Yandex Translate? They wouldn't have the option for their language. And vice versa, how would companies or the government communicate with that group of people? It's a major problem that needs to be solved. And in some cases, there are groups of millions of people who can't communicate effectively with others in their own country. One example of this is the Quechua language spoken in South America, where the main language is Spanish. There are nearly three million people of which speak Quechua natively 
He may not be able to read or write Spanish to communicate with the respective government in Peru, Bolivia, or Ecuador. Here's yet another even more complex problem that comes from India. India has nearly 1.4 billion people and speaks about 500 different languages. However, for languages like Hindi, one of the most widely spoken languages in India, there are only many, about 100,000 examples in some of the particular domains. At the lowest level, Canada, or Canada, and have only had 100 examples at a time. Other languages in India that were actually some of the first forms of language that have known to man are written on a few documents or even walls. It's hard to imagine how most people have to communicate effectively around India with such complexity. This happens in other regions as well. But here, we see a clear definition of the lower resource language problem. The lack of parallel text makes it nearly impossible to create models for translation or even generalized language models to understand and quantify new documents. Apart from a low resource problem, language that is easier to get is harder to model. Twitter and chat languages don't actually resemble language that humans understand at a high level. The lack of entire sentences and more formal stop words and punctuation make it harder to understand the language on the web. Other documents are too specific and thus can't be used in everyday language. <coughs> documents like legal documents and OCR are very specific to the domain where they occur. For example, if we were to train a model based on legal text, it may consider a document a docket, or even more humorous, a supreme sandwich may be a sort case, a court case. Ideally, we can knowledge, uh, we can take knowledge gained from all of these domains and mimic human behavior very much like we do as human ourselves. That's where natural language processing comes to the rescue. Natural language processing is used in text analytics to gather unstructured data from various sources like newspapers, books, and the internet. The idea is that after gathering the unstructured data, we can find ways to structure the data using various methods. Once the data is structured, then it becomes easier to come up with analytics and it gives us a way to understand like humans. For example, if we read a newspaper article that discusses a tennis match between Nadal and Federer, we would expect to see things like the score, the best saves, the frequency of serves, and more. By structuring data using natural language processing, we can attempt to classify passages and the text to specific topics. At a more complex level, we could even attempt to translate the entire article to a different language. Capturing data in an unstructured format obviously presents us with a myriad of problems. Typically, the overall objective is to understand the syntactic and semantic structure of passages found in different bodies of text called corpora. Corpora provides us with digital text that can be processed and comes in different shapes and sizes. For example, a web page can contain several pages or corpora that can be converted to text files. Nonetheless, there are several problems that come up while attempting to extract syntactic and semantic meaning from documents. Human language in its most natural form doesn't really abide with the grammatic rules and is left for interpretation. In the past, we used rule-based models with statistics to classify text into a structured format. Nowadays, the models are typically all linear or nonlinear models based on language theorems and captured natural language quite better than before. In natural language processing, in order to add structure to data, there are several options. One of the options is not actually even an option. 
All techniques in NLP require that text be tokenized and cleanized. That means separate the words and punctuation in an understandable way. Sometimes it is valuable to lowercase all the text, and other times we want a more natural cleansing called true casing. Other options involve tagging the different parts of speech. For example, we are looking at tags here for everything in the sentence. She sells seashells on the seashore. <laughs> the tags come from a set called the pinned tree bank, which an experiment done a long time ago where the tagging system has held true for today. There are even tree-like structures that can be built using tags called dependency trees. The sky is the limit with adding structure into natural language processing. But we will stop here due to the time constraints. Once the text has been transformed and the desired structure is in place, one can process the text accordingly. However, a model needs several examples despite the structure. So, the main question becomes, how can I create a model that will understand text even if I don't have enough training examples? Let's think about babies and how long they take. Typically, a baby doesn't even see real phrases or talk until two or three years old. And full control of the language and its grammatical structure are learned all the way until the teens. How can we thus expect a model to give us what we want in a quick amount of time? Typically, we want models to give us stuff in hours or days, not months or years. The nice thing about everything being digital is that there is always an answer that may not be what you expected. Here's what one would typically need, in my opinion, to build a good language model. In order for a human to feel somewhat confident about the language produced, some say that we want 95% accuracy. When's the last time you used Google Translate? Were you convinced of the translation? It's a hard metric to measure. It's an ideal world where we could get syntax boundaries from documents at nearly 100% of the time. And at a minimum, we would have 100,000 examples to train a model. The model should be balanced to prevent what's known as overfitting and should give us very accurate linguistic information. Most models don't reach this optimum and they're not ideal world solutions. Especially those low resource models like the ones used for translation where there are only a few hundred examples readily available of parallel corpora. Don't fret, my friends. There is a solution. A machine learning technique called transfer learning can help bring data from previous experiments to new ones. It can be thought of as a parent who has many years of experience giving a baby knowledge from their learned life. Additionally, while the knowledge being transferred is not necessarily the most adequate for the baby, it can be tuned in the case of transfer learning. Since the domain is quite different, big data is needed to cover all the potential examples that one may occur. In the case of language, lots and lots of data can be stuffed into structures that serve as input to a model. That leads us into what we consider is enough to be considered big data. I had a discussion once with someone about this. Is big data measured in examples? But what if I have two sentences written over and over 300 trillion times? Is that big data? This slide presents my thoughts on what I consider to be big data. 
this may actually contradict my previous discussions on the topic, and I think it's always changing. In my mind, the data must be varied enough to build a quality model. And yes, typically ends up being several gigabytes of text data or terabytes of image data. A good example would be books. Books contain several pages of data and are yet around 20 megabytes on average. The books are typically in one language and probably serve well for a very specific domain. But to build a model using books alone, one would probably need several hundreds or thousands of books in several different languages. Since the term big data doesn't have a hard definition yet, I will stick to enough quality, balanced data to build a model that interprets well. So, with the definition of big data established, the question is, where do we get that kind of data from? All of you machine learning people are going to think immediately, Kaggle, Kaggle. Yes, Kaggle is a good source for data experiments, and that's why I put it on the list. However, there are also a lot of other domain-specific sources that we should consider. Common corpora and natural language processing typically includes legal documents like the European Parliament text or Europol. Patent data often serves well for specific cases. One may find other sources by searching natural language processing papers on Google Scholar. Typically, Wikipedia, the Brown Corpus, Penn Tree Bank, movie reviews, but there are so many more sources, and to be honest, it really depends on the language. One of the best sources for languages, especially for low resources, low resource languages like Quechua, believe it or not, is the Christian Bible. Once we retrieve the data from other resources, we must then tokenize or cleanse the data as I already mentioned. This makes the data ready for, ready for input to the models. Document sentence or word level features can then be extracted from data that serves as input to an artificial intelligence model. Some of the techniques that are most often used in natural language processing are the removal of what's known as stop words. Stop words are common words in a language that are typically redundant and serve little to no purpose at all. In some cases, we even remove punctuation as what we may really be looking for are word similarities. The task then becomes how do we take advantage of billions and billions of words using a machine learning model of some sort to classify brand new text. We will discuss this shortly. Let's just keep in mind that the data must get a massage before being presented to a model. Before we can actually run a big data experiment using the most state-of-the-art models, we should try to see what type of machine-level computing will be necessary. With the advantage of tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch, we were able to take care of multiple cores and calculate algorithms in a quick way. Before GPU and TPU processing, jobs would take months and years providing understandable results. Depending on the size of the data, processing even with a GPU or TPU may take weeks or months. However, this would be negligible considering the same job 20 years ago was impossible. It's funny to note that the idea of neural networks actually existed many, many years ago, but until now, it was not practical to try them. With the advance of computer architecture, artificial intelligence, and the processing of complex data, it's now feasible. And by the way, some of you may ask, what's a TPU? That's a tensor processing unit, specifically designed by Google for TensorFlow processing. We discussed where to get the data from, the machine to process the data, and how to get it ready for models. Now we're going to focus a little more on how transfer learning works with big data. In order to transfer knowledge from one domain to another, we use models that have been previously trained. That way, the saved model serves as a mechanism to be loaded into memory for classification or other things. Oftentimes, the models are part of a high-level paradigm called embeddings, 
where models are frozen in time and used later to transfer knowledge to a new model. In that case, the new model immediately gets all the previously learned knowledge and can use it via vectors in a technique called vector space modeling. Vector space modeling applies specifically in natural language processing to build vectors of information in a numeric format to later be used in machine learning. The vector space models used for transfer learning and natural language processing are known as word embeddings. Word embeddings provide semantic structure and can be pre-trained from any set of text. Ideally, they contain word information at the sentence and then document level. One known mechanism is called term frequency and verse document frequency, or TFIDF, where each word's representation relates back to its document. Word embeddings are typically created by training a neural network. They are the byproduct of a classification task and consist of several features that represent semantic similarity between words like man to woman and king to queen. They can be downloaded from public websites and are a key piece to making natural language processing tasks work better when they are lower resources. Now that we know what word embeddings are, let's cover how they are typically created. One can create their own word embeddings or download them from the internet. In a domain-specific situation, the preferred way would be to create your own embeddings. Here's how it's done. First, as in the case of most NLP tasks, we must, we must tokenize and cleanse the text. Then, we want to perform a procedure called stimming, which gets at the root of the words. Then we use what's known as a bag of words technique to classify a set of words, typically subsegments of sentences. The classification technique will create the embeddings as a byproduct of training the model. The actual model can be thrown away. What's needed are the vectors that are later used during the deep learning phase. Lastly, we save those vectors and provide an indexing mechanism so that they can be used by other models. As I mentioned, the most typical way to use word embeddings, at least initially, is to download them from the internet. There are three main types of word embeddings that you can download based on their respective algorithms. The three main types are word to vec glove, and FastX. Word to vec is probably the most commonly used word embedding type. There are currently many pre-trained word embeddings, sets online, processing using word to vec Glove, on the other hand, is typically used when the user decides to incorporate knowledge from tons and tons of web pages into their project. The Glove embeddings are based on a mathematical premise known as the log bilinear probability representation. Many projects also use Glove. Lastly, but certainly not least, are Facebook's fast text embeddings. They are usually used in many places, and while they're downloadable sets on fast text websites, one can process custom word embeddings using the fast text framework uh, quicker than others. Now we're going to focus on the two main word embedding types, which are Glove and Word, word to vec. Specifically, I have drawn out the code on how word embeddings are loaded in just one line of code. Thanks to the GenScene package in Python, the algorithm doesn't have to be created that will process the input file. This particular file is the one download from the Glove website that is of six billion words. The vector makes itself only 100 dimensions, but can be considered highly effective since the vector space reduction is done using a very powerful algorithm. I included some sample output here for two words. As we can see, floating point numbers are used to represent the dimensions, and the vectors are simply several floating point numbers that correspond to a particular word or an integer from a dictionary. Here's what we are seeing, two vectors, one for each word. Each column in the vector represents one of the features previously learned using a classification method as explained earlier. 
With our word embeddings in hand, we can begin to come up with an overall model that will work best from our data. The word embeddings become the first piece of inputting the encoding or training phase of a model that can classify textual data. They are easy to load and can serve as vectors into linear or nonlinear models. Typically, we will see word embeddings serve as part of a more complex deep learning model. But as the picture depicts the word vector along with the bias variable can be thrown into a regression or softmax model. That provides the final classified output. For our purpose, it's good to know that word embeddings are easy to load and configurable. If you are loading word embeddings on your laptop, you can simply specify to load a lower dimension model of the word embedding if you prefer. That way, you can save more time and memory when running the final model, which will do computations during the decoding phase. <coughs> Since neural models seem to perform better on most data, we introduce deep learning as part of the slides. This is a high level pass on deep learning, so feel free to search deep learning on Google if you want to learn more. In my opinion, there are four basic principles to a deep learning model or neural network. Classification, where the models are used to classify text, typically from a sequence of text like sentences in a document. Activation, where the nodes in the neural network will light up or activate, supposedly like the neurons in the brain, which means that the node has been used as the highest performing node in the layer. Loss functions are then written using typical log loss functions, but can also be custom customized. And propagation is the computational part of a neural network. All neural networks have forward and backward propagation. Well, some are feed forward only, but those can be classified almost as linear networks, which defeat the purpose of deep, deep learning. To be clear why we use neural network models as opposed to others, typical linear models, neural networks are able to capture ambiences and the text that our other models aren't able to do. Recall the king to queen, woman to man idea? That's what neural networks are good at doing. They're also good at finding outliers or tales from distributions where something out of the ordinary shows up in the text. There are many types of neural networks that one could use, and while convolutional neural networks work well for natural language processing tasks, they may not be the best equipped for all tasks. As an overview, the two main types of neural network architectures are called recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks. Recurrent neural networks make room for what's called attention in some of the later architectures like the LSTMs and GRUs. Attention networks feed data learned back into networks and recurring mechanisms that allow data to hold long <coughs> sequences. Imagine some information that may be in a document on a page one, but you need that information from page 100. This is what is known as time series information handling. With natural language processing, most tasks are covered by a convolutional neural network. NLP tasks may be handled in a sentence-by-sentence -sentence manner like the examples here. The two-word filter represented by the two-by-five yellow matrix first is matched to the words I and like. A number is gotten using a dot product multiplication where 0 0.6 times 0 0.2 is added and gives us the 0.51. This is same done for like and this. In order to better understand the two main phases of deep learning, I present this slide. This may be review for most of you, but it's the training and decoding phase typical in most machine learning uh, applications. By combining a convolutional neural network with word embeddings, we can bring the knowledge from previous iterations to the new model. One easy way to do this is by downloading the word to back or glove pre-trained embeddings and loading them via one line of code. Word embeddings help provide semantic meaning to any classification task, especially natural language processing tasks. Here, we see the typical architecture of how word embeddings are passed along to a neural network and the sentence. Bernie Sanders and Obama is doing a great job. 
convolutions process the data and pass activation along to hidden layers and then use a softmax linear algorithm to narrow things down into desired classes. Meaning is generally captured better than most default linear models, and that's what makes deep learning powerful. The ability di to dissect word meaning similar to humans. My particular favorite as an avid Linux user is the Microsoft to Windows as Google is to Android. Some of us have had to take graduate entrance exams and may remember the analogy section where we see this is, could be very helpful. Now that we've seen about natural language processing and how deep learning can be applied to word embedding via transfer knowledge, let's look at how it pertains to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can be said to cover many fields, and it does. Data science could probably be considered the application of a lot of those fields within AI. In natural language processing, there are subfields such as information extraction, question answering, and text generation. While I actually myself work in all of those fields, my thesis and a lot of my work is dedicated to machine translation. So today, the idea is to cover how big data is used to help NLP cases of low resources. The latest work from machine translation experts focuses on two main paradigms. Phrase-based machine translation, also called statistical machine translation, and neural machine translation. My original work was on phrase-based MT, but has since blossomed into heavier neural-based MT. Times have changed due to the computer architecture, which has allowed us to process more data in shorter amounts of time. Neural MT is very good at doing things that before we couldn't, such as ca capturing ambiance and meaning of particular sentences. We see the examples here that I pulled off of the web where Neural MT uses vector space mass to come up with sentence level features for translating English to Russian. At the same time, we see how phrase based MT groups words in a word based translation projection. Since neural machine translation and deep learning is sexier, let's review the neural machine translation paradigm. Most of the latest work on N NMT is done with the idea of an encoder-decoder philosophy, where encoding is done in the source language and decoding is done in the target language. The source language is the original language to be translated and the target language the desired language. Google and Microsoft translations are typically used using this type, are typically done using this type of architecture for their translation. However, there are some hybrids used for different languages. Nonetheless, we will focus on the phases which are similar to the training and classification phases that we have already discussed. OpenMT uses an RNN. I know I said that we would use a CNN up until now, but for machine translation, there are specific cases where an RNN actually does better. And in this case, we will go over how the RNN works for machine translation. Here we see the encoding-decoding phase of an RNN and where the attention layer sits for translation. First words, A, B, C, and D, and the picture are presented into the system. In the picture, A, B, and C, D are words in a source language. The attention layer is then used for both the source and target languages such that new input during the encoding is contextually aware using the attention layer of the source input. All the while, we can clearly see how low resource languages can use word embeddings, even from different languages, to help learn and translate them to other languages. Some of the major systems out there are seen here in the slide. All of the MT systems are open source and can be downloaded and used by anyone. Moses is an older phrase-based statistical machine translation, translation system and is probably one of the most widely used MT systems in the world. Up until the resurgence of deep learning, Moses dominated the scene. Nimitus and OpenMT are the latest and greatest open box neural machine translation systems. They can be considered the highest performing for most tasks, but not all of them. 
We could cover up uh, and over all of the MT systems, but let's cover up the ends of the both. Why performance varies depending on the system and the language. Since we are going to cover the performance of MT systems, we should probably touch on how they are measured. The main way to measure MT performance at this point is via what's known as a blue score. Blue is one of the better correlative scores that seem to mimic human scores during the phrase-based MT age. I must say blur because my supervisor will kill me if I don't say it correctly. <laughs> However, there are opponents to blur that say it doesn't measure up well for MT systems and thus other scores have become popular. But the downfall we have to blur is that it was made for statistical machine translation systems. Other scores such as word error rate, translation error rate, and human translation error rate are now uh, showing that things are getting better uh, with neural. <laughs> we can see this, and I'm willing to bet that if you were to ask yourself which one of the translation metrics would be best, every one of you would probably answer something different. <laughs> For now, we will see the latest published papers, which including my own, use blur scores as a key piece for evaluation. Okay, let's now dig into the more interesting work on performance. In this slide, we see one of the most famous comparisons of phrase-based machine translation by Kuhn and Knowles. Before, uh, they were actually both personal friends of mine. The graying line marks neural networks and the blue line marks the phrase-based NT systems. Measurements are using blur, where a high 20 is considered a good translation. As we can see, as the corpus size, the number on the x-axis gets bigger and NMT begins to dominate. This paper has pushed the industry, especially those in favor of MT, as it shows the SMT doesn't do bad with fewer examples. I also published a paper on machine translation paradigms with Rebecca Knowles, and here are the results. My thesis work was done on a technique called fuzzy match repair, where we used an MT system to help translate uh, translators that edited translations. Here we see the main difference between using NMT and SMT for the English to Spanish language pairs on fuzzy match repair. NMT actually scored better when used as a back engine for a fuzzy match repair and were error rate. However, when strictly measuring the MT output, SMT did better. While we have shown some domain-specific cases for languages that do well in statistical machine translation, it can be said that neural machine translation is generally better than most. It has also been found to have a higher leg in research that's been done with human preferences. If one wants to create the best MTA system, the ideal situation would use both paradigms in an ensemble system that would give the best performance. Here's the moment we all been, we've all been waiting for. Well, maybe not all of us. Most of you are probably falling out of your seat of boredom. Ha ha ha. Here's how OpenNMT performed. The test is on English to German and using blur score as an evaluation metric. We see that OpenNMT outperforms its predecessor, Nematis, by a little over a point in blur score. That could almost be considered insignificant. But nonetheless, it is a game, and nice to know that we can use it with pre-trained word embedding. This result is kind of perplexing, right? So which MT system should I use for low resources that take advantage of big data? My recommendation is to use a hybrid system that combines the power of neural machine translation with statistical machine translation. You should always make sure that a human can verify the translations, so think Amazon Mechanical Turk or professional translation services. If your language pair has little to no data, you probably want to use pre-trained pre word embeddings from another language to help in some way. And most importantly, the more data you can get, the better. Thank you. Good versus the weather is not good. 
for the word not to stop word for the majority of data. Yeah, so typically when dealing with word embeddings and uh, machine translation, um, the data itself would, you, would, you wouldn't take out knots because knots are generally, at least for machine translation purposes, they mean negation. And so negation would throw the entire sentence off. Um, so when we think about stop words in English, or in Spanish for that matter, it would be uh, words like and, uh, maybe even the, um, typical stop words from the English language are actually in packages for Python. So if you were to search on Google, you could find a list of stop words, or you could create your own custom list. Um, in my case, if I were to see that specific example, I would probably just remove the word not from the stop list. <laughs> What to do with no parallel data as well? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and so that's where I was going after. Um, so we would typically try, and actually one of my, my master's thesis was on um, translating Quechua to Spanish using Finnish. And this was before we actually had word embeddings available. Um, so Finnish was very much like Quechua because it has a lot of suffixes, which that's called an agglutinative language. Now, glutative languages have, very much like German, um, lots of suffixes that mean different things. Um, and so what we try to do in the language world is find, first find wording values for a language that can be considered similar to the language we're trying to translate with no resources, and then parallelly put that into a um, neural network. Thank you. And one more. Is there any way an MT model can be retrained during inference when user modifies or places? Yes, that's actually part of the stuff that uh, Rebecca Knowles is working on as well, uh, with Philip Kuhn and people from Alicante as well. That's called online learning. So online learning is basically um, very similar to what you would see in uh, some of the latest um, um, neural deep learning techniques called reinforcement learning, where you have an agent that it basically gathers some of the, the uh, translations. You measure the loss for every translation you have, and then put that back into the model and online or actively. Okay, and the last question? <laughs> What's wrong with Cal? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with Cal. I think it's, um, uh, at least for today's purposes, uh, it's, it's done a lot. We pushed the bar <laughs> using Kaggle. Uh, that it basically allows pretty much anyone uh, to download some of the latest and greatest data sets and perform machine learning. So there's nothing wrong with it, but for the natural language world, um, typically we don't use it as much as people in the machine learning world would. Machine learning world is more, you know, one of, one of the things my students always ask for is um, they want to do um, disambiguation, in other words, uh, sentiment analysis. So when I give a project to my students, I say, okay, I want you to do natural language processing project, nine out of 10 of the students come to me with sentiment analysis. It's a binary classification problem and everyone's learned this from Kaplan. But to be honest, it has very little to do with linguistics. And thus, um, if you're going to deal with linguistics and try to find grammatical and semantic structure in language, you would have to find corpora that's more specific to that language. Thank you very much. Thank you.